in the previous video, we began looking at the specific duties owed by a trustee to a beneficiary, which is the main fiduciary relationship that we are concerned with. And we talked about, about making a profit. So a person in a fiduciary relationship may not make a profit from the relationship, but they are entitled to remuneration. And we are now going to be looking at a few more of these specific circumstances and these specific duties that are owed by fiduciaries. So the first one is acting in good faith. Fiduciaries also have a duty to act in good faith. Trustees are required to act in good conscience and without dishonesty at the most basic level. This includes avoidance of conflicts of interest between the trustees' personal interests and the interests of the beneficiaries and the duty not to make an unauthorised gain. Good faith has been described as an apocryphally indefinite term by Waters. Uh, so it's not always that clear what is actually meant by good faith, as you may know from your uh, lectures on contract law and my own videos on contract law. So a fiduciary has a positive duty, unless he is authorised to the contrary, to extricate himself from any position of actual conflict and to disgorge any gain made from his position of trust. And the main case that we want to look at with this respect is Odyssey Entertainment and Camp from 2012. Now, I like this case because it is the clearest example of naked bad faith I've ever come across, okay? So, Camp was an established film sales agent who was also director of a film sales and production company, which was Odyssey Entertainment Limited. Camp, however, had concluded that remaining with the company would not allow him to make the large capital profits he wanted to, to achieve. In other words, he believed he would have better prospects working by himself. And he decided to convince his fellow directors that the company was no longer viable and that the company should be put into voluntary liquidation so that the directors would not be personally liable. Now, acting in bad faith, he presented false and unduly pessimistic forecasts of the company's financial prospects, which led to the decision for the company to enter voluntary liquidation while still solvent and profit profitable. In other words, Camp, who is the defendant here, told the board of the production company in bad faith that its financial prospects were poor so that they would enter voluntary liquidation, which they then did, and therefore enable him to escape his contractual obligations to the company. This allowed him not only to escape his contractual obligations to the company, but also to cherry-pick proposed deals in which the company had an interest. So he wanted to cherry pick the contracts for his own personal benefit. So by making the, the company in bad faith enter into voluntary liquidation, uh, there were a number of proposed deals in which the company had an interest which were to fall through as a result of the liquidation. But now being free of his contractual obligations with the company, he could cherry pick these deals for his own gain. In the end, Camp was held liable to account for his profits, so they could disgorge his profits made from the breach. In working behind the company's back to develop his own opportunities, Camp was not acting in a way that would promote the company's success and therefore had broken his duty of good faith. So he breached the fiduciary duty that a director owes to his company, one of the established relationships considered in a previous video. So in other words, in this, case, Camp, in this case, Camp deliberately and in bad faith persuaded the directors of a perfectly healthy company to enter into voluntary liquidation by deliberately misleading them about its financial position. This was a breach of the fiduciary obligation directors owe to their company. Another fiduciary duty is about conflict of interest. So a conflict of interest will be uh, held to arise where a fiduciary has a personal financial interest in a transaction affecting the person or company to whom they owe the duty. So you cannot put yourself in a position of potential conflict. And we saw in the previous video the case of Matthew, uh, where a mortgage lender claimed inter alia that its solicitor had put himself in a position of potential conflict with 
its interests because the solicitor was also acting for the borrowers, in other words, the purchasers, in connection with the conveyance of land. So a trustee must not carry out any transaction in breach of his fiduciary duty and in particular he must not grant or sell any trust property to himself that is the rule against self-dealing and if he purchases an equitable interest in the trust property from a beneficiary the onus is on the trustee to prove that the purchase was fair and that he took no advantage of his position this is the fair dealing rule and now related to this idea is the idea that a trustee is not permitted to make any unauthorised profit. So failure to declare such a conflict by a company director is now a criminal offence. And this is seen in the Companies Act 2006, as we saw in a previous video as well. So at its most basic, if you are a director of a company and they are talking about which bank the company should set up an account with, and you happen to be a shareholder in Lloyds Bank, and that is one of the banks being considered, then you should declare that there is a conflict of interest. Mm -hmm. In practice, though, that low-level interest is unlikely to find a criminal charge, but that is the general idea. And so we have this case of Isaac and others and Isaac from 2005. So in this case, the managing director, Mr. Isaac, um, of a particular company was a shareholder in his own right and was also a trustee of a family trust which also had a large number of shares in the company. What happened was that a large national building firm, Travis Perkins, was looking at buying the company. The beneficiaries of the trust were very keen for this to happen because the managing director was not distributing profits but putting it straight back into the business and not declaring a dividend. So although the beneficiaries of the family trust were on paper making um, a lot, they had a lot of capital value, they were getting no benefits because no dividend was being declared. It is also quite difficult to sell shares in a private company. So the beneficiaries under the trust were extremely frustrated that even though there was a huge trust fund, they were seeing no benefit, benefit from it. So they were very keen for the company to be bought and their shareholding to be converted into a publicly traded company like Travis Perkins, which would give them a yearly dividend, which would give them an income from their trust fund. But the managing director, Mr. Isaac, scuppered the deal. Travis Perkins said they would only go through with the deal if 75% of the shareholders approved it. Now, Mr. Isaac, by voting his own shares against Travis Perkins' acquisition, prevented the deal from continuing. So the beneficiary of the trust sued for breach of trust, saying he is obliged to act in the best interest of the beneficiaries and said that their best interest would clearly be furthered by selling the company. Therefore, he should have voted his own shares in the beneficiary's interest. But the court disagreed. The court said that he could deal with this property for his own benefit. So in these circumstances, when dealing with his own property, he can act in his own benefit. So although there is a conflict of interest, it is a declared conflict of interest, which is okay. And this is what the uh, judge Park had to say in this case. As respects his personal shareholding, he was entitled to make up his own personal mind about whether he was entitled in selling to Travis Perkins. And he was entitled to reach his, um, his decision about that, uninfluenced by the fact he was also a trustee of the family trust. So there are situ some situations where Although it may look like a conflict of interest, it actually isn't, as was shown in this case here. And the last particular situation I want to look at with regards to fiduciary duties is acting for a third party. So in general, where a fiduciary is acting on behalf of one person, they cannot act on behalf of another in relation to the same issue without the informed consent of the beneficiary. So this doesn't mean a trustee cannot be the trustee for more than one trust, and it doesn't mean that a solicitor cannot be a solicitor for more than one client. But it does mean 
a solicitor cannot represent more than one client in relation to the same affair. For example, a solicitor cannot act for both the claimant and the defendant. And another example, the solicitor, the solicitor cannot act for both the buyer and the seller. They must have separate legal representation generally. Although they can, with the informed consent of the clients, so act if those interests coincide. For example, if you have group litigation, the solicitor can act on behalf of all the claimants if those interests coincide and all the clients know about it. So I've got a few different, like two or three different cases to look at. And the first case is Hilton and Barker Booth. And in this case, a firm of solicitors was acting for two parties who were entering on a joint venture. One of the parties, B, um, had previously been declared bankrupt and had served a prison sentence. The firm also loaned money to B so that a property purchase could be completed. It was held that there was a breach of fiduciary duty. So during the, the negotiations and the making of a series of contracts, the firm Barker Booth and Eastwood failed to inform Hilton that B had been made previously bankrupt and served a prison term for fraud. This was a breach of fiduciary duty. Secondly, Barker Booth and Eastwood confused their own interests by lending money to a client B. So this was a breach of fiduciary duty too. However, there are two circumstances in which a fiduciary may act on behalf of two or more people in respect to the same manner, where the person has given informed consent and the party's interests do not conflict, or where the circumstances are such that acting on behalf of other parties is an implied term of the relationship. In other words, it is common practice to do so. Okay, and the other case on look at is Kelly and Cooper. In Kelly and Cooper, the estate agent was acting for the sellers of two adjacent properties, so two properties that were next to each other. Both houses were shown to a prospective purchaser who agreed to buy one house. He then made an offer to buy the plaintiff's property. The estate agent did not tell the plaintiff that the same purchaser was buying both houses. The plaintiff claimed that this was a breach of fiduciary duty as the information was material and would have allowed him a negotiating advantage. The Privy Council found that, by their nature, estate agents were expected to act for more than one principal. The information received by virtue of their acting for the other purchases was confidential to that fiduciary relationship. So just to reiterate this case, an estate agent owes a fiduciary duty to the persons he acts for. The estate agent knew but did not tell the plaintiff that the owner of the second house wanted to buy both houses. Clearly, as the houses are next to each other and having bought one house, the second house would be worth substantially more to him. The plaintiff said that if the estate agent who owes him a fiduciary duty had told him the person had already bought the house next door, he could have substantially increased the price. And, you know, he was in a strong position here to get more money out of the purchaser. But the Privy Council didn't agree. An estate agent obviously acts for different sellers and they, there may be a resulting conflict of interest between different sellers. By the nature of being an estate agent, these situations will arise and it is implied that anyone who consults an estate agent agrees to them conducting their business as usual. Also, it was held that the information received by virtue of their acting for the other purchasers was confidential to that fiduciary relationship. So it would have been a breach of um, their duty to disclose that confidential information to the other party. And finally, we have the case of Rossetti Marketing. And this is another case where a person thought he had an exclusive agency, but that agent acted for another furniture manufacturer. And when they found out that the agent was acting for other furniture manufacturers, Obviously, there is a potential for conflict of interest because, for example, they have two lots of sofas to persuade shops to buy from. The agent for Rossetti Marketing Limited claimed that there was an implied term, like with the estate agents, that they could act for other furniture makers. But the court disagreed, 
they held that there was no implied term in an agency agreement with a furniture company that the agent would be able to act for other companies. In fact, when you agree to act as an agent um, for Diamond Sofa Company Limited, acting for another furniture maker whose interests may be in conflict was a breach of your fiduciary duty. Okay, so that wraps up some different fiduciary duties from the last two videos now. And in the next video, we're going to be looking at the specific circumstances of the duties of trustees. So that is the main fiduciary relationship that we are concerned with in equity and trusts. But if you have any questions about this video, then please leave a comment below and I'll get straight back to you as soon as I can. Thank you very much for watching and I shall see you next time.